Hello, everyone. This is um, an interview with Peter S. Beagle. Uh, hi, Peter. How are you? As I said um, before we talked, I'm terrifyingly wide awake, which is not usual. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, so, Peter, you're the um, author of a very famous novel, uh, The Last Unicorn, which we're talking about, and some others, but... You know, I understand that when you uh, started writing The Last Unicorn, you already had another novel under your belt. So can you tell me, like, what your... Um, this is all lay the foundation for what your experience as a writer was when you started writing this novel. Well, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I can't re Even before I could write, I would make up stories and get my mother to write them down. Um, that was always there. And I was a writing student at the University of Pittsburgh in the 50s, which is really quite rare. There was Pitt and Harvard and maybe one or two other places that gave degrees in creative writing. It was very unusual. And in the, I remember because I was writing about this recently, in the summer of, it would have been 1958, I was a music counselor at a summer camp in Cold, it, yeah, Cold Spring, New York. Surprise Lake, the camp was called. There were a lot of jokes about the name. <clears throat> and after the, the campers were put to bed in the evening, there was really not a lot to do unless you had a girlfriend at the girls' camp across the lake, which I didn't. But I did have my... My little Hermes noiseless portable typewriter, which my parents had given me when I went out to college. And and I had a lot of paper and I had a room to work in. So I started writing my first novel, A Fine and Private Place, because I figured, well, I'm 19 years old, it's time. And it was very, to me, it was very much influenced in. in by the work of Robert Nathan, whom I hadn't met yet. We were friends for the last 20 years of his life, but fall in love with his work, and I want to write something like that. There was a book of his written before I was born called One More Spring, and I wanted to write that, but Robert already had. So I started writing um, his novel set in Central Park during the Depression, and so I started writing a novel set in in a cemetery because I grew up about a block and a half from one of the most best known cemeteries in New York, Woodlawn. It sprawls into out of New York, out of the Bronx, into Yonkers, and everybody from Herman Melville to oh, Babe Ruth to any number of, oh, Mayo LaGuardia, I think, um, any number of famous or semi-famous gangsters. And so I, and I knew it very well as a, as a green place that my friends and I used to just wander around in and pre pretend to be scared. We never could because we knew the place too well. I've never been scared in cemeteries for just that reason, my background. And so I started writing a novel about an old man, he seemed old to me, who's been hiding out in the cemetery for, as it happened, 19 years, me being 19. And it just went from there. Um, it's one of the few books that I more or less outlined as I was going on, which I almost never do. I should. I recommend it to every young writer. But except with that and one other, I've mostly just made the things up as I went along. But a fine and private place came out when I was I just turned 21. And I still can't judge it, really, today. Um, because all I can really see when I look at it is... That kid, I wrote three chapters that summer, and then I went back to college for my senior year, and I can still see that kid 
typing or trying to type very quietly at night. And that, that noiseless portable is kind of a misnomer. I don't think there is such a thing as a noiseless portable or a noiseless computer for that matter. But um, I really was trying not to wake up my roommate who was quite good about it on the whole. And, and I had the auspices of two really splendid writing teachers at Pitt, Ed Peterson and Monty Culver. And I, I know I dedicated the book in part to Ed Peterson. And I should also, also have made Monty part of that dedication but did at least speak at his retirement ceremony. Anyway, um, as I say, I can't judge it, but it's still in print. And I think that's mostly to do, to do with the work of a great editor, one of the last of the really great ones, um, Marshall Bates, B-A-T-E-S. Marshall Bates, who was fought with me almost every step, even of that book took out even comma placement. He took out my whole, whole mystery subplot that I worked so hard on. He just yanked it. And I, as I say, I fought him every step of the way. And to this day, I wonder because he's long gone. Did I say thank you? Did I have sense or courtesy enough to appreciate just what he'd done for that book. If it hadn't been for Marshall Bates, I don't think that book would still be in print, but it is. And it has its own particular cult. People who um, like The Last Unicorn well enough love a fine and private place. It's a personal matter. So, yeah, I was, I was incredibly lucky. You know, looking back at almost 80, it's hard for me to believe um, how many people went out of their way to help me along. That, that's fantastic. Um, so br bringing it to The Last Unicorn, you relayed to me a story of how you were in a cabin in the woods with your friend when you started writing it. Can you can you just tell that for, for, for my audience who may not have heard it? Well... In a few, in a week, less than a week, I'm flying east to where the weather is at single digit. Where it's brutally cold, and and I'll be spending a few days with my best friend in the world, whom I've known since we were both five. Are you there? Oh, oh, good, good. Something's beeping. Um, my best friend in the world. His name is Phil Sigunik, S I G U N I C K. And we have known each other since we were five years old. I think we met in kindergarten. He's always been um, always been a painter. He was always drawing the same way I was always making up stories. And when we were 23, we shared a cabin in the in the Berkshires in in Massachusetts, where it was understood that this we were to be extremely professional. I'd already published one book, and I had no idea what to do next. I spent a year at Stanford writing a novel that, however you slice it, just isn't very good. I mean, it's got very good parts, very good bits in it, like the curate's egg. But as a whole, no, that wasn't it. And I'm very glad that Viking, my regular publisher, declined, declined it very graciously. But I still owed them a book. And... Phil would go out every day to sketching and painting in the, in the Berkshire woods. And I'd be by myself in the cabin wanting to show him that when he got home and we cooked dinner and played our guitars all night, I was working too. And I literally started finally after a couple of false starts with one line. The unicorn lived in the lilac wood and she lived all alone. I didn't really know what a lilac wood was. And I didn't know very much about unicorns. So, okay, now what? And I started sentence by sentence making up a story about the unicorn that thinks she's the last one in the world. She is, isn't, as it 
turns out, but she has every reason to think so. And as it turns out, um, the novel that people know because it was made into a movie isn't what I wrote that summer. I mean, you would recognize elements and characters and paragraphs if you knew the book. But originally, well, first, as people know it, the unicorn encounters a kind-hearted but failed magician and a tired, angry woman, and they go off on their search together. Um, they're just tagging along with her. And in the original version, they're not there at all. And the unicorn meets a two-headed demon, one named Azazel, which is a proper de demonic name, and the other's named Webster. <laughs> and those two, those two heads argue and snark and bitch at each other in a way that Phil and I have always done. If you knew us, you would know the, you would know those heads. And I just made it up as I went along because we were right there. So there are bits and pieces nobody will ever catch on to because nobody else was there. There's a, there's a, a mildly dirty joke about Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip which was cracking us up at, at that summer. Um, nobody knows it except us, as far as I know. And bits and pieces of old poetry, old songs, radio commercials, because I have a trash memory, like the butterfly who the unicorn encounters. It's very hard for the butterfly to speak in his own voice because he's read and heard everything. And when he really tries to tell her what's happened to her people, it's very important. We can almost, almost get it out. And I think that, I think like that, because just this morning at breakfast where I'm living, one of my table mates said vaguely, there used to be a song called Slow Boat to China. And just sitting there over my fried eggs, I sang the whole song automatically. It's one of my favorites. And I haven't sung it for 20 or 30 years. But I remember it word for word. I have that kind of memory. I wake up with old songs and poems in my head. Earworms, as they're called. And there aren't always the best either. Sometimes it's a good poem. Sometimes it's ridiculous. Same with songs. But... But that's how I am since I've been a child. I was very shy. It was very difficult to me to talk to most people except those two closest friends I met in kindergarten, Jake and Phil. And I could always sing. For some reason, I had no fear of singing. I've been told that the songs and speech come from two different parts of the brain. And I believe it. Because my own life is has pro proven it out a lot of times. And I still love singing. And I'm very proud of the fact that I was dinner music in a French restaurant for 12 years in Santa Cruz, California. I sang on weekends, um, 25 bucks a night, Saturday and Sunday, and very good French dinner. And I loved it. God knows I've done it for nothing. I'm very grateful that the boss very kindly offered to pay me. But the thing I remember about that summer more than anything is that I wrote and Phil sketched and we cooked dinner, um, which we called the good shit because it was throwing everything that was in the refrigerator together. <laughs> and... And um, afterwards, afterwards we'd sit and play our guitars pretty much all night. You know, when we living at home, sooner or later one set of one cup, pair of parents or the other would throw us out. But here we could play all night if we wanted, and a good deal of the time we did. So I remember that summer with great affection, and my 
regular publisher, um, Jacob Weisman of Tachyon Press, asked me to publish that first account, all 50, 50 or 60 pages, that first version of The Last Unicorn, with an afterword explaining what that summer was like. And there's certain books I remember as having been more fun than others. And I did like writing about that summer. Um, I marvel at what I wrote because I don't remember a lot of it. But as I say, I'm looking back a lot now. I'm wondering, um, did that really happen? Yeah, it did. People tell me. Of course it really happened. There it is in writing. Okay. <laughs> so so there's yeah. So so what led you to sort of sort of make make the changes that you did to your original um vision of the last unicorn to the version that's, you know, widely known and loved nowadays. As the afterward says, um, we spent the sum that summer together, and then we raced our motor scooters back to New York City. And I knew that I'd be going out to California because I was already involved with a woman there. She'd already had two girls by two different husbands. And then there was the third one, the boy. And I knew he was mine. I mean, it was official. I had to, as it turned out, because she had been married to somebody else at the time, I had to adopt him as long as the, along with the other two. But there were those three children. And I liked my wife well enough. She's a very fine woman. And we got on very well. But what made the difference was that in my family, you don't abandon children. You just don't. So that they were, and there she was, and there I was, and I was 24. And I had to become a, a professional awfully fast. I had to learn how to feed people, how to put bread on the table, which I'd never had to do. And so I became a professional writer, doing anything I was asked to do by magazines, a lot of them from the Curtis Empire, which doesn't exist anymore. But I was very grateful because they gave me assignments and then taught me how to do them. And, and I also remember that after I came back, came to California and settled in the, in the woods and hills of Santa Cruz, I wrote a book that was probably more fun than any book I've ever written called I See By My Outfit. And that was about Phil and me coming to, back to California, where Phil had never been, I had, we came to California on a couple of motor scooters because we were from New York. New York. We didn't know any better. Um, New, York, New York kids do not know how bad, at least they didn't then, they don't know how big the country is and how high the Rockies are <laughs> and the fact that they're heading straight into the west, western wind. It took us about a month, and I wanted to call the book um, How to Freeze, an instructional manual, <laughs> because we were cold so much of the way. But the publishers, understandably, didn't want to call it that. And so they named it after, after a song that the Smothers Brothers used to do. It's an old folk song called um, The Streets of Laredo, which is funny because... Larry McMurtry, who was one of my first, was my first friend in California. Larry eventually used it as the title of a novel. And it was also one of the first tunes I learned when I was playing, learning guitar. Because my father, who played mandolin, knew the tune. So he'd play it and I'd accompany him on the guitar as best I could. So there's, the Smothers Brothers used to do a parody of it. The song start, starts out. You know, I see um, with a, a man singing, I see by your outfit that you are a cowboy. And the Smothers Brothers parody was, I see by my outfit that I am a cowboy. 
And I'd sing that, and Phil would sing back, I see by my outfit that I am a cowboy too. And then we'd sing together. We see by Phil doing the harmony, because I could never do vocal harmony. Um, I see by, we see by our outfits that we are both cowboys. If you had an outfit, you could be a cowboy too. So the book is called I See By My Outfit. And I wrote it really quite fast. That's first summer in California because I had an advance from my publisher. And it that was probably more fun than I've ever had writing any given book. And Holiday P- Magazine picked it up and serialized it. So the money from that was sort of my, if you like, survival scholarship fund because they... Money lasted longer in those days. You may have noticed. Yeah. This is 1964. And it, it fed us for quite a while while I was learning to do magazine pieces, and book reviews, and everything else. And it was only several years later, in 1966 or 67, that I very cautiously began to pick up the last unicorn again and look at it. I started all over. Um... Saving this, changing that, throwing that out, and and slowly it became a different novel with with connections to that old one. And I'm glad to have that first version published because there's so much I don't remember, let alone the things people that are never seen, the things I remember writing, as I said. And I remember conversations between um, the two the two demons, Azazo and Webster, and just I find myself thinking, "Damn, that's not just that does sound like Phil. I got that right." So um, I taught myself the same way Phil and I taught each other guitar. We picked it up about the same time, in the same way. Um, I taught myself to write novels while I was writing them. Um, I don't know any other way to do it, really. But I always tell young writers, don't do what I did. Plan it out. Write an outline. Do. I can think of at least two writers, famous ones, who wrote biographies of their leading characters that in some cases were almost longer than the novel they figured in. I can never do that, though I admire it. But but somehow, somehow stuff got done. And I know a lot of people who have written a lot more books than I have, and I like their work. Um, by, by contrast, I've written a handful of things. Part of that's laziness, I'm sure, intellectual laziness. Part of it is that it takes me so long to figure out what I'm actually doing. I can be five five chapters into a book before it hits me. No, that's not his story. That's her story. Oh, well, shit. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's go back to where we went off the rails and started again. <laughs> there is one thing I do know how to do, and that's start over. I've done a lot of that. Um, so that that's what happened with that book. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so you 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 told me that um uh a lot a lot of the things about the last unicorn, especially as it was went on, were not necessarily like planned out in a story structure, which I thought was really interesting because I when I read it, I saw some very clear like themes, or at least I interpreted some very clear themes from start to finish. I think one of the clearest ones is probably um, aging. Everything seems old. Everything in the book seems, you know, aged, you know, in some way or another. Um, and I, and it also uh, sort of keyed into like the unicorn as a symbol itself. So did. So, so, so I want to ask two things. First, was it intentional? And the second thing is, um, uh, how did that emerge? Like, were you sort of halfway through the book and you realized that 
you were writing a book about aging or would did was your intended theme planned from the beginning or did it did you kind of just write what felt that made the most sense and then stepped back afterwards and realized that you had written to a theme that type of thing that's closer to it i the energy i use is that i've always loved telling myself stories in the apartment building where i grew up there was a little alcove almost a little not a cubby hole exactly it's just just a little secret place under the stairs just across from the building's mailboxes where as a solitary kid I could crawl and curl up and tell myself stories and in a very real sense I'm still doing that <laughs> because um, I have to find out how it comes out I never know that I've finished a book until I'm literally on the last lines oh oh that's it that's it you're finished I've also told people, go straight through a book. Do not try to write the third draft while you're writing the first. Go straight through it or you lose the momentum. Then go back and make it look as though you knew what the hell you were doing in the first place. <laughs> um, that, that's the trick. It's supposed to look easy. The images I use range from um, artists, guitarists, to, to baseball players. I saw the last days of the great Joe DiMaggio, and he was a hero when I was my boy, and the first days of Willie Mays. And they were two of the greatest outfielders ever. I saw them both. And the difference is that when Mays went out for a fly ball, quite often he knew perfectly well that he could catch it. But with Mays, it was an epic adventure running at top speed, his cap flying off. And I really do think Mays bought his caps just a size too large. So they always fly off when he was running after a fly ball. DiMaggio, on the other hand, um, was just there when the ball came down. He just glided after it. It was supposed to look easy. And that's really it. If I identified with DiMaggio as an artist, it was, it's supposed to look easy. You know, it's supposed to look as though you always knew what you were doing. <laughs> and I think about that. Today I'm trying to teach myself a particular guitar tune by, by Jerry Reed, who most people in this country remember as an actor in Burt Reynolds' movies. But as a guitarist, Reed left a body of work that other guitarists like me are still trying to to work out. Yes, yeah, I see how that works. But uh, how, how can you do that? Um, you can hurt yourself making that reach. No, oh, oh, I see. I see if you do it with the with the pinky. Yeah, I, I could do that. Might take me a while to recover, but I could do that. <laughs> but but it's like that. Um, with Reed, it just looks easy. There's there are cuts where. Nearing the end of a tune, Reed just bursts out laughing on the soundtrack. So pleased, you know, the, to, to be Jerry Reed and, and doing this, the pure pleasure of, of making up this tune that seems so logical. That's mostly it, it's figuring out, figuring out the logic behind it. And Reed, in an interview, said that his, his description of the guitar as an instrument was so it's simply... It's options, lots and lots of options. Well, it's like that with writing too, of course, any form of art. I could do it that way. No, that's a blind alley. It looks good, but it's not going to get you anywhere. So I, I, I do not deal with symbols. That's one thing. People always find symbols and parallels in my work. And I make a big point of the fact that, um, that I have no no connection with C.S. Lewis. For instance, I'm always compared to him, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I, admire, I admire Tolkien enormously, of course. But I think I'm one of the few fantasy writers of my generation who knew, now that is a blind alley. There is no point in even trying to imitate that. But 
what I particularly admire about Tolkien is that he constantly told his admirers, I don't do symbols. That is not a symbol of that. And good for him, because there are people who have made entire academic careers out of figuring out Tolkien's symbology. <laughs> and I know there are people who have done some academic work. I remember <laughs> um, make, making a mistake once at the, I always forget the full name of it, it's the, the um, fantasy equivalent of the Modern Language Association. Um, I always forget the full name, but I was invited to a seminar on my own work. I know it takes place in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I made the mistake of going to hear people reading papers on my work. Damn near fell asleep. Um, <laughs> there was a, I learned that. There was a, a woman whom, whose work I knew who had written very nicely and intelligently about my writing over the over the years. And there is a character in my novel, The Folk of the Air, who is, in fact, a very ancient goddess. She is so old, she remembers not being even a, a human figure. She can remember being a, a black rock stone that was worshipped. And her name is Sia, Athanasia in Greek. And um, I didn't know that in Greek it, mean, it means um, ancient and beautiful, something like that. And how wasn't it really clever of me to pick that name for that char character? And then I had to get up and say afterwards, Jane, I picked that name because there was this Greek girl in one of my high school classes whom I had a big crush on. <laughs> and that was the only and that was the only Greek name I could think of. Oh, that's great. And and that and that happens more than not in my work. There's usually a reason, but it's never the reason anybody else thought of. Um and I never meant, I certainly didn't mean to apologize, to humiliate her. I apologized left and right afterwards, during, during. But, um, but that seems to be the way I work, by guess and by God, by fumbling my way there, and then making it look as though I always knew what I was doing, that I had some, some immense and immortal plan. I don't. I really don't. I'm just, in the end, making it up as I, as I go along, telling myself a story, as I always have. Okay, so so um, that 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 sort of like comes out. I imagine like once you've got the finished like um, the 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 finished story out in front of you, like um. But uh, how, can can you can you give us some insight into how you go from you know, getting the story out and, you know, flying by the seat of your pants writing wise to, and how you go about changing that to something that you would say looks as though you knew what you were doing the whole time. Well, that's, that's language more than anything. That's, um, that's going over it. As I am right now with the book I'm working on thinking, you know, there's a, perfectly good line but there's a better one or no no that's not the right adjective damn it I hate adjectives cut it out um, and this um, I know certain things about myself I've always been written about aging in one form or another since I was quite young I don't know why but that's always been there and in the same way I think, oh, that uh, flows. That's a nice line, but uh, damn it, there's just too much alliteration in there. You're not writing a Scandinavian mythology. Um, no, you got to break that up a little bit. And I try to stay away from adverbs as much as possible. Don't, 
don't describe what the character's doing. Let the reader see that or feel that. Because the, as in every form of art, the reader, if he stayed, if he stayed with you this long, does so much of the work himself or herself. One of the people I use as an artistic example was a film producer of the 1940s, 40s and early 50s, Val Luton, who was usually given a buck and a half to make a, a, a movie. And there were certain traits about Luton's. He'd take grade B actors because they came cheaper, but he spent a lot of time, time and money on the screenplay. And um, he's best known, I guess, for you know, a minor cleave, but very real ca- classic cat people. And in spite of the fact that one is called, the early 50s called, I, I Walked by, With a Zombie. Actually, it's Jane Eyre. It's Jane Eyre just <laughs> translated into Haiti. He did the best he could with what he had. But he said something that has always struck me as a sometimes screenwriter and as a novelist. He said, and this is this is he said long before there was anything such thing as CGI or the things they can do now. He said, in the end, the monster is always an actor in a monster suit. The shadow is real. And Luton did wonderful things with shadows, with things you're not sure you saw, things just around the corner of your eye, which is really what I'm writing about in the first place. Um. There's always that thing that you're not sure you saw. I try to get that in almost everything I do. I'm not suggesting that that was a monster. It's like, it's, but it could be. It's like the classic scene in, in the cat people where um, the, the, the heroine, a major, major female character, is from Central Central Europe. And she tells her husband, very frankly, when they begin getting together, that in her village, the, the superstition or the belief is that when w- women from that village get emotionally excited, whether it's passion, sex, or fear, or anger, they turn into panthers. She's not sure if that's true or not, but she's afraid of it, which is why clearly she stays away from sex with her husband, who's very understanding, knows the story, but who inevitably begins just for even conversation, begins seeing a woman at work. And his wife finds out about it. And one evening, she follows the woman who he's been not necessarily sleeping with, but spending time with. The woman comes out of the building where she works and starts walking, walking home, and the, the wife follows her. And Luton cuts back and forth between two sets of, of heels on the sidewalk, just one followed by the other, the clicking of heels. And the woman, the wife becomes aware that something's following her, and she, she begins to speed up, walk a little faster, and the heels behind her speed up. And the woman is really frightened enough that she's afraid to look back. She's not running, but it's the nearest thing to it. And the camera goes back and forth between the two sets of heels, and suddenly there's an explosion. I've seen a whole theater come come to its feet. Almost everyone in the theater, there's an explosive hiss, like that of a great cat, you know, making its final leap. And then the camera pulls back, and for heaven's sake, it's a bus pulling up behind the, just along with that the fleeing woman hitting the brakes. And she leaps aboard, you know, and is rescued, carried away. The camera goes back down the street. You don't ever see, you know, a panther. What you do see is a bush, a large bush waving angrily, as though something very large may have just gone in there. 
You don't see the the, the panther ever. You see that the you hear the sound and the shadow, and that's all. And it it certainly saved Luton a whole lot of money on this minuscule budget. But that's how it's done. I always use that as an example of what you show and what you don't show. So, so a lot of um, a lot, a lot of the meaning is left up to the reader to almost like interpret out of the text using the text, you know, or using your story as a uh, as, as basically a baseline for their own reading. Yes, and if I have to use a monster, one way or another, okay, the monster's there, but it has to be a, a human scene all the same. Um, my favorite of my own books, I was, just gave my my one of my two copies yesterday to a dear friend, a librarian in Berkeley. He was one, truly one of my best friends. And there, uh, there I, I definitely do have, you know, a monster I made up. And I do have... Um, Creatures, undeniably, but what I think holds the book together is that the the characters re, re, reacting with them are as human as I could make them, even if this is a, a fantasy. That's the thing that, especially Tolkien's imitators, never seem to catch on to. The best of them do, but um, it's it's not enough to. Give some give somebody a magic sword, and have some, and draw a map, with a few odd names in it, and just and a few local terms um, for for onions and toothbrushes. The the best book I know on the subject is by the late Diana Wynne Jones, called Fantasy: The Rough The Rough Guide. And it goes over every single cliche of modern fantasy, how you deal with it, treating it as though it were a guide. You know, England on um, England on five dollars a day, like that. <laughs> um, it's very funny, but it's also it's also <laughs> deadly accurate about the things people do, writing fantasy, thinking they're inventing something. Is never that easy, and the more fantastic it is, the more human it has to be. At the same time, there's some people I admire enormously. I can't even do what they do. There's a guy named uh, Michael Gruber, G R U B E R. All I know is that he's about my age, maybe a year older. Lives in Seattle, and I've never re read a book of his. Or I don't find myself thinking, is it too late for me to go into another line of work? <laughs> because I don't usually want to meet writers. I've met too many. I actually like some, friend, close friends with others. But as a group, that romance wore off long ago. Mostly I hang out with musicians wherever I can. But, but damn it, he's good. What the hell does he know, and how does he know that? And where does he get off knowing as much as he does about magic? This guy who I I know has a degree in um, oceanography or something like that, and I once I once wrote papers or speeches for Jimmy Carter. How does he know this shit? That's alarming. <laughs> and so that's always there. And he, yes, his books are fantasies. And yes, he knows what to do with magic. But it's not like the fantasy anybody else is doing. Damn. So that's always there. Always there. The, the envy and the superiority. Well, at least I didn't, didn't pull that shit. I knew better than that. Mm -hmm. um, there's always that. But... Um, as I say, I've been doing this a long time, 
It was all I wanted to do. I had to learn to do other things. But this left to myself. This is what I would have done all the time. And yet I there's a gap in my bookshelf because now there's only one more cop one remaining copy of the innkeeper's song. So I put a, a book there hasn't been any space. So I put a book in there that very few people know called The Lady and Her Tiger, which is my one as told to book. Which I I did it as the story of a friend of mine who I was close to for more than 30 years. Her name was Pat, Pat Derby. And she did, she was Dr. Doolittle. She did talk to animals and she was, um, she was a ballet dancer when she was 15. Her father taught English, father taught Shakespeare, Cambridge. And because he wanted to try a, a, a Romeo and Juliet with the ages they would have been in their time. Pat was playing Juliet when she was 12. But when I met her, when I met her, it was at a Hollywood party. Um, one of the, I think the first one I ever went to. And there was this little red-headed woman there in a beautiful green dress, absolutely lovely. And she was holding a coyote puppy in her arms. I've always been fascinated by coyotes, and I know a puppy or a cub when I see one. And I started across the room to introduce myself. At that point, the puppy wriggled in her arms and peed right down the front of that beautiful green dress. And she never turned a hair. And that was Pat more than anything. And I went across the room and introduced myself. And we were friends till she died. And and she she was extremely literate. Um, I think her favorite book was Nathaniel Hawthorne's The House of Seven Gables. And whenever I visit, visited there, because the idea was to write about her, she and her husband at that time were just scraping by. There was always the question of how you get, thank God everybody, every animal needs eat chicken necks. You can always buy another carton of chicken necks. And I wanted to be able to help her feed the animals. And so when I went down to visit, um, one of my automatic chores, something I always did, was take the old wolf, Sylvester, for a walk. And, or he took me for a walk. But the thing is, I loved being around animals. I was comfortable with them. And eventually, I talked talked um, E. P. Dutton, the publishers of Winnie the Pooh, into hiring me to write Pat's story. And I came out in 1976, and and I'm still really quite proud of it because I got Pat's voice. And I got, I got her to talk about the things she did not want to talk about, because she talked about the animals all day. But I wanted to talk about her background, and I wanted to talk about the mistakes, the things she learned that haunted her to that day. Um, this morning, for God's sake, I'm was reading in the New York Times, who has been have been putting out a series of autobiographies, articles on women who, for one reason or another, never had New York Times autobiograph biographies when they died, and so it ranges from, you know, my heroine um, a, um, Ida B. Wells, you know, who was a black journalist back when nobody wrote. wrote biographies of black journalists, all the way to a woman I should have asked Pat about, Mabel Stark. Mabel Stark, who was the tiger lady. Uh, no, I know the name. 
because Pat usually hated trainers, especially, especially ele- elephant trainers. But damn it, did I talk to her about, about Mabel Stark? I have to look, look through the book because I don't remember. She was somebody Pat would either have admired or loathed, possibly both. And so, so I've got that book that very few people know about, but I'm very proud of it. And the last time I saw Pat, uh, who loved elephants above everything, last I saw her, an admirer had given her something like 2,600 acres um, somewhere east of Sacramento, Gold Rush country, so she could have, among other things, elephants. And the last time I saw her, she was still small, red-haired, um, surrounded by elephants, Indian, African, all of them reaching down to touch her with their trunks. And that's the way I like to remember her, because she died not long after that of throat cancer. I think she was 68. But that's the, the, that's the stuff I remember doing, the that's the stuff that, for one reason or another, moved me in a particular way that people writing dissertations on my fantasy characters don't always do, oh, yeah, yeah, that seemed like a good idea at the time. That's mostly what I wind up saying. Seemed like a good idea. Anyway, it was the only thing I could think of. Like that. Um I know I'm rambling no, because it's, it's, a pri- <laughs> it's the privilege of the old. We get to ramble. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm a little bit worried because I'm already a rambler and I'm only in my 20s. So I'm wondering how bad I'm going to be when I'm in, when I'm hopefully, when I make it to my old age. <laughs> oh, you could doesn't even bear thinking about. <laughs> I could, I could pro- probably lecture to an empty room for hours. Um <laughs> Phil and I have long conversations in which one of us will finally in which one of us will finally say, What the hell what were we talking about? And the other usually answer, I thought you were keeping track. <laughs> I already have things like that. I start people will like ask me a question and I'll start answering it, go on a twenty minute tangent and then have to stop and ask them, What was the original question again? Um I do it. One of my favorites right? Yeah. One of my writers who meant a great deal to me was Avram, Avram Davidson, whom I knew. I am not sure. Well, Avram went to four colleges, didn't graduate from any, wound up at one point teaching, teaching on the university level, when nobody quite knew whether they should class him under mythology, creative writing, History, he always screwed up the bookkeeping, which is the worst thing you can do at a university, as I found out myself. <laughs> but I have a book of Avram's I wrote a foreword for um, called Adventures in Unhistory. And mostly it's, it's Avram's incredibly ramblings. And once, he, he always come back to the original topic sooner or later. But I can remember visiting him and putting a Six pack or a bottle of vodka or something on the table between us, just saying, Avram, tell me stuff. Because I firmly believed, and I do to this day, that Avram knew everything. <laughs> uh, so I'm very, I'm very proud of having written that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, we. we is that is it, would you say that that's like you know reasonably good analogy for sort of how the process of communicating a story goes to people like you 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 just like you you just write the story as though you're rambling because you're you're making it up as you go and then they'll gleam some kind of consist consistent narrative from it in the in the in the thing because because well, because that is. And then I said, then the trick is to make it look as though you always knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, so like, so, so stuff like the um the aging themes is is that stuff that that 
emerges and that you notice and you sort of like cut down to so you're like you know this seems to be a consistent theme i'll i'll cut the story down or i'll change edit bits so that they're more like in line with what seems to emerge as the main theme or is that something that's a lot more interpreted by the audience a fair amount is interpreted by the audience of course but i do know i have a tendency i have had all my life to overwrite and i learned particularly from robert nathan to cut it down always cut it down so i have drawers full of perfectly good paragraphs and pages from this book or that outtakes you could say that you don't throw away because you never know what you might need that image um nobody's getting any younger you might not remember that um save it i always save it but i cut if a book is getting if a book's getting anything beyond 300 pages I get very worried about it because I don't believe I know enough to write fat books, doorstops, um, <laughs> huge trilogies. I can't do that. Um, I have a good friend who's a splendid writer, um, Patrick Rothfuss. Pat's a hell of a good writer, and Pat has a big fat trilogy, but he gets away with it because he's that good. So all you, really all you need to be is that good? I've said that. I know at one in one interview or one lecture or another, if you're good enough, anything works. All you have to do be is good enough. Oh. There are there are writers, some writers I admire, knowing I couldn't do that. Okay, I'd, I'd fall on my face if I tried that. But oh, that's good. I remember. <laughs> I remember. Um, Long ago, in the folk music days in Berkeley, circa 1961, there was a guy who came to Berkeley that summer with a reputation of having developed a technique of playing the banjo three, three times as fast as anybody else. And I was very cool about that. I'm a guitarist. I'm not, I don't touch the banjo. I wouldn't know how. But I went to hear him with a friend who was a banjo player. And the guy did play three times as fast as anybody. Superb technique, absolutely no no soul. But you couldn't knock the technique. And my friend listened for quite a while and finally sighed and said, wow, I'd like to know how to do that and then not do it. <laughs> there, are writers, there are writers I feel that way about. Oh, yeah. So what ones where like you, you can see they've got like the technique but like you wish you had the technique so that you know you, it'd just be a part of your repertoire, but that you could like apply it to something that had like substance in it. <laughs> exactly like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so... And go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I'm not, no, I was just clearing my throat or realizing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time, but something that I do want to touch on is, um, would you be able to talk about some of your inspirations for The Last Unicorn specifically and how you incorporated um, some some of that into, into your writing especially? Well, I know. I can tell you names that were ins inspirations to me. One um, certainly was the Lord Dunsany. Um, I was gratified to see... Ursula Le Guin, and Ursula, Ursula was the, the master of us all, but Ursula wrote of Dunsany. He mined a, a narrow vein, but it was all his own, and it left a lot of people trying to do, trying to do that, and only getting the superficial stuff. And she talked about, he had a lot of imitators, ranging from Tolkien, who got... You know, the least, you know, the, the tricks Dunstan he had to teach him went off on his own. People like Clark Ashton Smith and H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard, all people you wouldn't think of would be affected by Dunstan. But all of them trying to write like that. And he affected me, certainly. Um, I wrote a foreword for his book, The Charwoman's Shadow. And all I could do at the end of the essay, 
talking about Dunsany, was to to copy the very last last couple of pages of of that book, the, the way Dunsany finishes up, and I compared it to, of all things, a, a scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where Butch and Sundance, the two outlaws, have been following and been followed and followed by a posse that just will not give up, no matter how far ahead of them they gotten, they look back and they're still on their trail. And some the, uh, Butch is a, really admiring. How do they do that? Who are those guys? I couldn't do that. Could you do that? He asked Sundance. Could you do that? And I ended by saying, about Dunsany, not me, boy. <laughs> and I feel like that. And I feel like that about certain writers. Dunsany was one um, Ursula was another, certainly. And Irish writer, James Stevens. James Stevens and T.H. White. Um, both of them had a quality that I've tried to emulate. They could have you laughing hysterically at the beginning of a paragraph or a page and have you in tears by the end of it. Um, T.H. White you know, can make me cry even, even while I'm, I'm laughing. And with all due respect, and I have a lot of it for Tolkien, Tolkien can't make me cry. It comes down to that. Um, Stevens can do it. White, certainly. And that's finally it. To the ones who can make you laugh and cry down there at the same time. Those are the ones I keep trying to be. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, you also you also told me that there was um, some inspiration for the Last Unicorn from uh, the White Deer by James Thurber, as well as the Wind in the Willows. Yes, yeah, the one the uh, Wind in the Willows was sent to me by my beloved second and third grade teacher Maggie Butterwick, B U T T E R W E C K. Maggie Butterwick, who was tall and skinny and Irish, and loved me. I loved her. A very weird kid sitting in her class, and she told my parents not to worry about my grades, or my lack of sociability, or the fact that I sat in the back of her class and reading, writing poems about Tarzan and the Lone Ranger. <laughs> and we stayed friends. We stayed friends when I was grown until she died. But when I was homesick, when, when I think I was nine, and I was sick a lot. I had a lot of respiratory problems. And Maggie sent home a book for me to read while I was convalescing, The Wind of the Willows. And if any one book can be said to have made me a writer, that was it. I wanted to do that. And the other is, um, the other is Thurber, the Thurber of the Thirteen Clocks, but especially the White Deer. And I'm amazed that other people haven't picked out the connection between that and The Last Unicorn, the only one who did was, of all things, the writer, the, the Broadway musical writer, um, Stephen Schwartz, who wrote things like Wicked and Pippin and so on. He caught it before we ever met. And he's the only one who ever brought, up, it brought it up in conversation when we did meet. As a consequence, I have a copy of The White Deer, autographed by Stephen Schwartz, and he has a copy of the the last the last unicorn. Um, no, I gave him my other copy of the white deer an autograph. That was a joke between us. Okay. But uh, sometimes direct effect, sometimes just sort of glancing. Ooh, yeah, I can see where I got that. And Robert Nathan, I can remember saying to me, "It's a bloody good thing you didn't read." Um, you didn't read James Branch Cavill at a vulnerable age because you'd have spent a lot of time trying to write like that. <laughs> he was quite right. My answer was, of course I didn't. I spent a lot of time trying to write like you. But, and that was perfectly true. Um, that's why The Last Unicorn is in, in part dedicated to Robert. And I went off on my own track eventually. And I didn't realize it. 
years later until until I finished a story called Professor Gottesman and the Indian Rhinoceros, which is still possibly my my favorite of my own short stories. And when I finished it, I realized, looking at it, oh my God, it's been all these years, and I'm back doing Robert again. Um, that's, wow. Yeah, that's me doing Robert. And I knew that the only person at that point who would pick up the, the resemblance was his widow, the English actress, Anna Lee. So I copied it out. I sent her the book before it was, story before it was ever published. And Anna caught the resemblance and wrote back, it's the best story Robert never wrote. <laughs> and I'm, I take that as a compliment. Yeah, of course it is. But Cabell, no, I got there too late. It's the same way um, Ray Bradbury got nailed by Thomas Wolfe quite young and never quite got over it. You can always spot the wolf influence in a lot of Bradbury stories. Just a matter of timing. Who you, whom you meet, so to speak. Literary marriages. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I think, I think I'm out of time, but, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been amazing listening to you. You're very welcome, Nicholas.